series of the Italian uh, Physical Society on Statistical Physics. Uh, this session is a, in a sense special because I mean the two speakers are uh, had uh, a mention at the Premio Paladin, both were uh, uh, selected from the committee as uh, outstanding uh, uh, participant to the Premio Paladin. And, uh, and so we will have uh, today uh, Loren Lorenzo Buffoni and, uh, uh, and Victor uh, uh, Buendia. Um, we start with Lorenzo. So uh, Lorenzo Buffoni received uh, his uh, master in physical complex system uh, from Politecnico di Torino. He then did uh, his PhD in information engineering at University of Florence, where he focused uh, on application of machine learning uh, to physical sciences. And he uh, had several collaboration with uh, research centers and uh, also I think uh, companies and uh, has been working on quantum machine learning and also on, on uh, deep learning techniques uh, applied to biological problem. He is now postdoc in the physics of information and quantum technology group of the University of Lisbon. So please, uh, Lorenzo, start your talk. Lorenzo? We cannot hear you. I cannot hear you. I don't know if the others can hear you. Now, now you should hear me. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. okay, nice. I, I'm sorry, I, I had the wrong microphone uh, selected. Um, so, and ca can you see my slides? Uh, yes, yes, okay, we fine. see you. Uh, even if I'm, okay, so uh, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at, at the seminar and thank you for the nice introduction. Um, so uh, I have 20 minutes, right, for the for the seminar. Yes, you have uh, 25 minutes. Okay. And then five minutes for uh, let's say question or a short discussion. Okay. Okay. So what I wanted to to talk about today is uh, some of my work that I mostly did at the University of Florence during my PhD, but uh, that I'm also continuing at the University of Lisbon. Uh, in my postdoc, which are uh, applications of machine learning in the physical sciences and vice versa. Okay, so the idea is that I would like to convince you, or at least uh, make a case, uh, for the fact that uh, physical sciences and uh, fundamental sciences in, in general and machine learning have a lot more in common than we might think, and that they can be worked together nicely uh, to benefit from each other. So, for example, uh, in, in machine learning, we do have some nice tools that have been implemented over the year, like optimizer uh, neural networks, uh, which are powerful uh, function approximators and learning based algorithms. Uh, but we also have some open problems that the community is struggling to solve. So, for example, the problem of um, interpreting what am I learning from my neural network, for example, the problem of speeding up learning or using more efficient in terms of energy resources for performing machine learning, and how can I have better generalization from my model and, and avoiding overfit. In physics, on the other side, you know, uh, you all know that we have plenty of tools, for example, network theory that could be used to deal with neural networks. Uh, all the uh, amazing uh, uh, things that have been done in statistical physics also to uh, addressing the, 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 the neural networks and problems of, of machine learning. Uh, and also new hardware accelerators, for example, quantum computers or uh, photonic devices and stuff like that. Uh, also, physics has its problems, uh, and uh, uh, these problems uh, can, could use some help from machine learning techniques. For example, the problem of uh, efficiently used data from experiments, uh, the problem to optimize the experiments itself uh, for to have noise mitigation or to like collect data in the fastest and most efficient way possible in terms of time consuming and also to simulate model and do theoretical ansatz to uh, like um, uh, 
uh, for calculations. OK, so I'm going to make uh, some cases uh, taken from some of the works that I've done. Uh, probably I will mostly talk about uh, uh, point one and three for, for uh, uh, time constraints, uh, and uh, I'll see if I can manage to fit in point four as well, uh, but I, I'll, I'll judge how much I, I go over time. So uh, the first thing, is uh, the first problem that that we that we might want to solve is to use existing machine learning techniques that are well established uh, to improve in some way our um, the knowledge that we can extract from some set of scientific measurements that we have taken and in particular uh, uh, i will focus on um, work that we have done in uh, in biology using data from biological data genomics data in collaboration with the broad institute so the problem that we are trying to address is the following. There are various techniques to do uh, RNA sequencing, so genome sequencing uh, from single cells. We have a single cell RNA sequencing, which is a very powerful and fast technique, uh, which can sequence the whole genome uh, at a single cell level, but uh, to do so, it has to destroy the tissue physically. So we have no spatial resolution whatsoever or on how, no special information on, on how the genes are distributed inside the tissue. We do have spatial trans transcriptomics techniques, uh, for example, Visium, that um, they are able to um, do sequencing, or sequencing on a lot of genomes and have some special information about it, but they lack single cell resolution. So the spatial information is very constrained. And they, we have targeted in situ techniques, uh, which are very precise in the sense that they can go at a single cell resolution and tell you which genes are in which cells, but they lack the ability of um, uh, sequencing the whole transcriptome. So they are limited to like a few uh, hundreds of genes. So what we want to do is uh, to have a spatial map of gene expressions at the single cell resolution. So use all this data and organize them in some ways in which we could pick the best of, of uh, all worlds and combine this information in order to, to, to like e extract a single cell resolution map of uh, um, sequencing ge genomic data. And to do that, we need to, to separate part of a deep learning pipeline to integrate histological images with the spatial data and integrate the spatial data with the single cell RNA sequencing. So it's a two-step process. Uh, the results are detailed in this work, which was published uh, last year. And the, the part that I wanted to talk about today is the part that I worked on uh, the most, which is the, uh, the first part of the pipeline. So the integration of the histological uh, histology with spatial data. So the problem here is that when we have a sample from the lab, uh, from which typically a tissue, a part of the tissue has been removed to extract the single cell uh, sequencing uh, genomics information, to uh, have some, uh, we have to match it with a reference atlas image, which contains a set of uh, pre-existing annotations and information about the tissue that we're looking for. But this process uh, traditionally has to be done by hand. Uh, the experimentalist has to mark some of these, of, of some landmarks, and these landmarks are, are checked against the, the atlas. And it's typically a process which is uh, time consuming. These are slices from uh, brains uh, of, of mouse. OK, so we are doing this with, uh, with mouse brain cells. Uh, what we want to do is to uh, automatize this process. And we, what we want to do is to take the experimental image, check it against all the Atlas images, and using a model which is commonly used in face recognition, instead of recognizing faces, we are uh, uh, fine tuning the model to recognize uh, which slice of the mouse brain we are, uh, we are actually uh, taking from our, our experiments and finding the best match in the existing atlas, which is already annotated. And to do this, we employ the, the, this deep learning pipeline, which has been like refined and fine tuned on the data that we have uh, 
uh, to, to do like uh, mouse brain classification instead of uh, face recognition, which is uh, slightly different, but not that different. And we, uh, we could observe that uh, the, in the latent space of this model, indeed, the neural network had learned a representation, whatever, like in, in whatever high dimensional space, uh, uh, which can be plotted in two dimension using UMAP, which is a dimensionality reduction technique, which is useful to plot things which are high, highly dimensional in, in two dimension. And uh, we can see that it has indeed learned to organize the various images according to the cortical depth at which it has uh, it, the, the, the slice has been taken. So the image up here, which have the label like zero, they are the images taken at the very front of the mouse brain and the images at the end of the latent space, which have coordinate 132, are the images taken from this, the slices taken from the very back of the of the mouse brain and you see that the gradient is very nicely organized and the neural network has really learned uh, to uh, like um, organize the information of the structure of the mouse brain and to effectively recognize and to match the image experimentally with the, with the correct uh, sample from the from the atlas the technique that that we used uh, was also able to uh, do some and to perform some estimation of the uncertainty on which it gives the prediction. For example, you can see that um, here you have the uh, experimental image and the best match picked by the, the algorithm in the atlas. And you can see that this is the curve that represents the um, prediction of the neural network against all the images present in the atlas. And you can see that uh, this, this curve has a V shape uh, is characteristic V-shaped in which the minimum is the image that effectively we, we select as the best match. And you can see that for the matches that are performed correctly or at least with a high uh, certainty from the model, they have these V-shaped curve that are really like they're pretty neat in the sense that the points are really V-shaped and you can fit uh, the, the correct function function on, on top, the correct theoretical function on top of them. But when the assignment is done poorly on the or the model is not really certain of the assignment which is doing, so you can clearly see by eye that this sample here is, is a clear mismatch. Uh, the, the shapes are, are all off. There are nothing similar to each other, these two images. You see that the predictions of the model are all over the place and you cannot fit this model with a V-shape. And so uh, you can use this as a, the, the quality of this fit, as a, of this V-shape fit as a trigger to say, okay, I'm not sure about this, please, uh, I need an experimentalist to come and double check the work that I've done. Um, given that, so we are able to automatically take an experimental sample and match it, match it against the Atlas to extract a set of information, for example, uh, the, the anatomical region map of which types of tissues are present in here, and also the cell density map. So how the density of the cell is, is distributed inside of these of these slice of tissue uh, that we use to uh, perform a sequencing, single cell sequencing. And then the second step, which I won't show today, but is able to combine this density map and anatomical region map with the single cell information, uh, single cell sequencing information that we extracted from here. And we are able to overcome all the limitations of previous techniques by this uh, clever use of deep learning and, and integration of various types uh, of data. So the other, I'm going to skip this real quick. Uh, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is how to, on the other hand, so I showed an example in, on which we can apply machine learning to improve our understanding of the physical world, even if this was a biological example, but uh, you'll, you'll pardon me if this is not uh, really pure physics. Um, and uh, the other thing that I wanted to show you is that we can do also the vice versa. So we can apply tools from network theory to improve the process of learning or improve, improve some aspects of it uh, at the very least. 
So uh, what we uh, what we are gonna do now is to take a neural network in which you have the inputs, you multiply these inputs by some weights, you sum them, you uh, do an activation function, and this is the output of your of your neural of your layer of the neural network. So this is indeed a directed graph, and it can be represented by an aviation symmetrics, which has the structure, so it has all ones on the diagonal and has some values, which are the values of the weights in this uh, lower um, diagonal block. Uh, and the results that I'm going to present here are taken from this, this work. Um, so what we asked ourselves is uh, uh, the following. So uh, if we know that this network is described by this adjacency matrix, can I do in some? Can I uh, go into the spectral space, so into the space of the eigenvalues lambda and eigenvectors uh, psi of this uh, of this network, and constrain them in a way uh, in a way that I can train this network in the uh, spectral space, so I can train the eigenvalues and eigenvectors instead of the individual weights, uh, and preserve this this structure of the adjacency matrix. The answer is is yes or oh, um, is yes, and uh, since we have this this uh, lower um, this block uh, structure, we have for free a nice property uh, for which we can analytically invert the the block matrix of of uh, lower triangular block matrix of the eigenvectors using this formula. So even computationally. This is not less efficient than, than doing the standard neural network approach, which would be to multiply the input for the, the weight matrix or the addition matrix A. We just have to do three multiplications instead of one, but it's not that it scales uh, badly with respect to the, to the size of the input or, or whatsoever. Um, so uh, we can do it, and the constraints are pretty simple. We just have to constrain the eigenvector matrix to be uh, to have this lower triangular uh, block structure. Uh, and once we have defined a single layer, we can just stack up multiple layers in which the um, eigen uh, eigenvectors of the layer K would be all ones and. Uh, some values different from from ones uh, on the I'm sorry on the diagonal all ones of diagonal all zeros uh, except from the elements that are going from the nk neurons of layer k to the nk plus one neurons of layer k plus one in the network which are the ones that are trainable okay in our model same goes from the uh, for the eigenvalues so the eigenvalues are all one except for the ones that connect layer K with layer K plus one, okay, here, which are trainable. So what can we do is that now we can work in the reciprocal or spectral space of eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the network, and we can tune the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, given the constraint that they have to preserve the structure, but we can put whatever numbers we want in here and in that. And we can learn the network into the reciprocal space. And what what do we get? Uh, so we implemented this thing in using a popular machine learning library, which is Keras. So we could replace easily swap in and out these spectral layers defined in this way from whatever model uh, we 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 like. And we tested this model on the popular dataset MNIST, which is a dataset on of handwritten digits in grayscale. Okay, uh, we benchmarked this uh, on a small network. It was a four-layer network, uh, network, and we trained the, the exact same architecture, both in the direct space, so using the conventional approach and using the spectral uh, decomposition that we that we devised. So the results are, are shown in this paper. So this is the accuracy on the test set with respect of the dimension of the, of the third layer, which is basically a way to say the number of parameters that, that we are training. And here you see this dashed line on top is the performance of the uh, traditional machine learning model trained uh, in the conventional way. This is the performance of the 
our spectral approach, okay, so training in the spectral space, which as you can see for a sufficiently large network, it matches the performance of the of the standard neural network uh, in which we are training both the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. The surprising, surprising thing that we found, however, is that by training only the eigenvalues, which are a small, small subset of the total trainable parameters, uh, and leaving the eigenvectors completely randomly initialized, we could reach like up to around 90% of the performance of the, of the fully trained network, which means that the eigenvalues are really a powerful parameter to gauge the importance of, of some neurons. And given that, we asked ourselves if we could use eigenvalues to do effectively pre-training, weight initialization or pruning. And uh, that's a paper that recently came out, is still in peer review, in which we show that really eigenvalues are a powerful matrix. Metric eigenvalues of the network are a powerful metric to decide which neurons are important and which neurons are not important inside a neural network. And so the not important neurons can be safely removed entirely from the network and the performance is almost unaltered. Um, while like the important neurons are really promoted to like uh, have an accuracy which is almost the same as the fully trained model. Um, the other thing that we found is that using uh, these tricks uh, of using like training eigenvalues and eigenvectors and, and only subsets of the two, uh, we could um, reduce dra drastically the dimension of the network. So here you see rho, which is a parameter that indicates the fraction of the total parameters uh, that we are training. So rho equal to one would be to train the same number of parameters as in the standard case. Um, and you can see that this is the relative accuracy relative with respect to the, again, to the conventional ma machine learning uh, approach of training all the individual weights. And we can see that using uh, these kind of spectral techniques that we describe in a bit more details in this work, um, we can use really a fraction of the total parameters that one would otherwise use. So even 10% of less of the total parameter and still retain like 99% of the of the original performance, which is really a huge improvement. And that's possible because uh, working in the spectra space instead of in the direct space of the network, we have these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are, which are parameters that tell a lot more on the importance uh, of the single neurons uh, with respect to the individual weights of the networks. And so we can use it to our advantage to do all this trick of like remove, removing neurons that are not important or avoid to train, to train neurons which are not important and waste computational resources. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm skip this last part about uh, the quantum stuff. And I wanted to conclude by uh, remarking that uh, there are important reasons to connect machine learning and fundamental science, namely to improve existing machine learning model, uh, but also to accelerate and improve existing experimental pipelines as we have uh, seen uh, on the biological example. Uh, we could also work uh, to have a better understanding of the learning procedure in deep neural networks, but also use visualization and dimensionality reduction as help for theoretical research. Often we find as theoreticians that we have to work in really high dimensional manifold and we lack ways to efficiently visualize this data and machine learning is uh, often really good at doing this kind of uh, dimensionality reduction stuff but also devise new hardware like quantum computers to accelerate mach machine learning and also automatically optimize experiments. Uh, that being said, I thank you for your attention and I uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Are there uh, comments or, uh, or uh, question? Uh, there is one question, Roberto. Yes, Lorenzo, um, can you provide us a very short comment, possibly, about yeah. um, um, the stability of these uh, 
of these reduced algorithms, I mean, you just showed us that working on uh, in the spectral space, uh, making use of eigenvalues can certainly improve mm -hmm. highly the performances, but or at least reproduce the same performance with which which costs much less. On the yeah. other hand, what about the stability of the overall procedure? I mean, if you just perturb the procedure, you just change that. Are you have you any idea about the stability of uh, this uh, process? So we haven't done an extensive study uh, in the sense like because stability in machine learning could mean a lot of things, right? It could be stability yeah. against adversarial attack. It could be the uh, stability in the convergence of the training procedure, et cetera, et cetera. So we haven't done an, ex an extensive, extensive study on that. Uh, what can I say from, from what we have done from now for now is that uh, we do not observe a degrading in the in the stability of the training procedure. So we, we are able to, to successfully train the network uh, every time, given the, the right initialization. Uh, and but it is possible that networks trains trained in this way are less robust to, let's say, adversarial attacks or perturbations of the inputs. We didn't really test that. Okay, thank you. Other question or comments? Um, I have one, one question. In your introduction, also in your conclusion, you, you were, uh, um, let's say, citing uh, uh, the possibility of automatically optimizing experiments. Yeah. Can you say an example? Can you say an example so about that? There are, there are some works that, that have been done uh, on that. Uh, so for it, like uh, if we go back to the biology example, mm -hmm. uh, this could already be seen as an automatic optimization of an experiment, right? In which you take uh, some, some data and you are able to extract much more information out of it. But there are also works that have been done in which an agent a machine learning agent is trained for trained for example to place optical uh, a certain set of optical elements on an optical table to produce some results and uh, uh, it has been shown that uh, you can train such an such a agent to to like find the best combination of optical pieces to produce the the, the experiments that, that you want uh, so yeah, uh, you, you, you can also do that or for example, uh, if you have an experiment which is dependent on a parameter or a certain pulse shape or whatever, you can optimize this, this pulse shape or this parameter using some of these uh, machine learning techniques. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments? So if not, we can uh, thank again uh, Lorenzo and uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing.